The Intermont motorcycle and bicycle fair rolled around in Cologne last week, with a lot of focus clearly beginning to shine on the area of electric bikes, electric scooters, electric bicycles, and even smaller devices. The highlight for me was getting a ride on the Yike bike, a tiny electric mini farthing, which is like a miniaturised penny farthing bicycle, a stable design, and it's the world's first commercially available vehicle would be small enough to warrant what I think is a new category, transportation appliance. It'll do 25 kilometres an hour, but it weighs so little and it folds so small it will fit in a backpack. It's carbon fibre, it, it's distilled functionality, it's just as computers have had to be continually redefined by category, from desktop to laptop to netbook to tablet, transportation devices of the future are likely to proliferate in the space between a pedestrian and a motorcycle. There's a big space between uh, plenty of things from the Segway through to these new Honda's U3X. Toyota also has several devices in, in this area. Um, some will be big, some will be small, and the Yike bike is by far the smallest viable transportation device we've yet seen. It's commercially available now. You can buy direct from the manufacturers over the internet and it's essentially maintenance free and we'll, we'll have a lot more detail in a feature video in the very near future. I also rode the world's fastest electric scooter, the 7100 watt ZEV, and I can tell you that it's a rocket ship. Uh, it'll safely negotiate you through the nastiest urban traffic. Uh, it, like the Vetrix, which is uh, only slightly slower, um, equal up until about 30 kilometres an hour and then the ZEV pulls away. Uh, they both offer essentially everything you need from an electric commuter. Good brakes, three speeds, better acceleration than almost any four-wheel device and it'll already do 130 kilometres an hour and over 80 miles an hour. It's electric and there's a lot more power and range on the way. So the, the, the future is very bright for electric scooters uh, on the pure motorcycling front, Aprilia showed a Max Biaggi special to commemorate its 2010 World Superbike Championship uh, for the RSV4R, which is undoubtedly the closest yet that a bike has come to a MotoGP bike, a, a bike that's available on the road. Uh, in, in terms of adjustability, we've never seen anything like last year's RSV4R but next year's APRC SE model comes with an array of electronic rider aids that is more comprehensive than we've ever seen before on a motorcycle uh, other than on a racetrack. There's an eight stage Aprilia traction control system which is fully adjustable, even on the fly, using a small joystick on the left handlebar. So if you're sharp enough, you can now choose the exact level of wheel spin for each corner on a racetrack as you go. Right? Only if you're sharp enough, though. You may not even be able to feel the difference. Like, like I'm not sure I can. Back in the pits, if you've got a, a pit crew available to you, because it would take you quite a while to do it on your own, uh, you can choose to reposition the engine in the frame. Uh, the rake and trail are adjustable. The, uh, the length of the bike, the, the wheelbase, the swing arm, that you can even swap in different length swing arms. It comes with... Uh, this year's model, the, the APRC SE model, comes with also with three-stage wheelie control, which we haven't quite worked out how it works yet. Uh, it may be one of those where uh, it stops you from flipping, uh, which might be handy, but it could also, I guess, be one where you can put it into victory lap mode and wheelie out of sight and have the bike keep it there for you. Launching a motorcycle is now a matter of engaging the electronics, holding the throttle wide open and doing your best with the clutch. It doesn't really matter that much because the bike will work it out and launch you optimally. Um, it's magic. There's also a quick shifter system that lets you bang your way up through the gears without using the clutch. The biggest announcement of the show was probably Kawasaki ZX-10R. Every now and again, Kawasaki likes to make a huge leap forward in motorcycle development. It's been doing so since the mid-60s when it came out with its three-cylinder, two-stroke flight H1. 
and then the H2, then the 900 four cylinder four stroke, and a, a range of motorcycles since then. So, almost 50 years of history of occasional quantum leaps forward. Um, and this is it. This is undoubtedly the new king of the castle right now. It is the most power, horsepower that a mo motorcycle, production motorcycle, has ever had 210 brake horsepower and it weighs just 198 kilos full of fuel and fluids so ready to go quite remarkable it so it has a better power to weight ratio than anything else in its class as well as more power um, it has a completely redesigned chassis it has traction control uh, anti-lock brakes all focused on making you faster than ever before on the road or the track the last few horsepower are available thanks to additional pressure from the ram air, that is the bike uses aerodynamics to force extra air down the engine's throat at high speeds. Um, the total 210 horsepower is a new record for a stock production motorcycle, beating BMW's S1000RR, which is the current commonly available, relatively, relatively reasonably priced uh, horsepower king. The the Caddy Desmo Sedici and the MV Augustas are much higher priced, high horsepower machines as well, but it beats all of them. Ignition timing accordingly. 
Another technological step forward is made by adding an ABS system. This Kawasaki Intelligent Anti-Lock Brake System makes sure you have maximum stopping power. Always. The completely new engine has a power output of about 200 horsepower and is now three-way adjustable, which means you have three different engine characters at your disposal, which you can set according to your own needs and preferences. The 2011 Ninja ZX-10R is a force to be reckoned with, boasting superb frame and suspension components, a 200 horsepower engine, less weight, advanced traction control, ABS, power mode selection, and a race mode instrumentation. The attention to detail evident in constantly refining models has seen Suzuki manage to pare 9 kilos from its next model GSX-R750. It's smaller, it has a smaller frontal area, it has a better aerodynamic profile, and by working every bit of the entire machine and working it over, they've managed to pare 9 kilos down. Quite remarkable. An innovation of engine design was everywhere. BMW's six-cylinder engine required all the ingenuity that BMW's vast forces could muster to build a 1600cc, that's closer to 1650 actually, but it's so small. It's an inline across the frame engine. It weighs just 102 kilos, yet it produces 118 kilowatts, 160 brake horsepower and a big fat torque curve. The engine size is a result of using a 72 millimeter cylinder bore, and there's just five millimeters between the cylinder sleeves, and it squeezes the whole lot into 555 millimeter wide block. Go and measure that out on a ruler. That, that's Experiencing the six cylinder scream at peak torque of 175 Newton meters at 5,250 RPM will be worth waiting for and the suitability of the beastie for effortless top gear turbine smooth touring is indicated by an incredibly flat torque curve that serves up 70% of the maximum torque from 1500 RPM upwards. So it'd be a huge hand of God in the middle of your back forcing you forward. The engine was just the start of the wizardry though, and there were several other firsts on the BMW 6s such as adaptive headlights and electronic suspension adjustment, both of which are firsts and pointers to the future of motorcycle development. BMW's electronic suspension adjustment means the rider can adjust the rebound damping properties of the front and rear spring strut and the spring preload and spring rate of the rear strut on the fly. You can actually finally adapt a bike suspension to suit the conditions as you go without having to get off and change anything pull out any tool kits. <clears throat> Perhaps even more relevant to the average motorcyclist was the other BMW first. Motorcyclists have had to put up with lights that don't point where you're going at night ever since motorcycles were invented. If you think about it, a light points out tangentially to the radius of the curve. Hence, uh, we've always had trouble riding at night and this is the first time in all that 120 odd years of um, of history that somebody's actually put a production solution on the market and this will be much safer. This is a great safety innovation. Anyway, the, the BMW six-cylinder was the lightest, most compact serial production six-cylinder engine in a motorcycle over a thousand cc in history until later that day when Horex an announced a six-cylinder, it's a, a very narrow um, offset piston 15 degree V6 1200 with a belt drive supercharger and, and it develops, apart from being unfeasibly small, it develops a meaty 200 brake horsepower. So in the muscle bike category, it probably going to go one step better than Yamaha's VMAX in terms of stretching your arms and compressing your eyeballs off the line, but it'll probably cost a lot more too. This is a high-end product with uh, a well-known 
name from German engineering history and it's going to be at the very high end um, of motorcycle offerings. But even those two launches didn't fully prepare me for coming across the Ducati V8 of German engineer Dieter Hartmann Wertwing. I hope I'm doing that justice, Dieter. Uh, Dieter is your can-do kind of guy. Four years ago, he undertook his first motorcycle project, creating a four-valve head for a vintage R50 BMW racer. People who know that bike will know the problems. Not only did it work, it propelled him to greater heights. Next up, he had this idea for creating a compact four-cylinder engine using one Conrod. So from a single-cylinder crankcase, he had this concept that he could produce four-cylinder engine. Here's the concept of the way it was going to work. So he took a single-cylinder 125 engine and made a four-cylinder 125 on a Honda 125 single, but it had four cylinders. Then he installed it in a monkey bike, and it ran, and it worked fine. So next up was taking the concept and doing something interesting and creative with it, like taking a V-twin and turning it into a V-8 and choosing the bike to do it with as a Ducati so that that beautiful trellis frame uh, offsets the, the V-8 engine. The motor, uh, the name Eleanor is derived from, I was hoping for something more romantic, but it's a derivative of the Ford Mustang GT500 in the film Gone in 60 Seconds. The entire motorcycle is now nearing completion as an 868cc V8 Ducati. The engine looks a treat, but it's the workings that mesmerise me. The system he uses to achieve such an astonishingly compact road bike is just fascinating to, to watch. It's um, our, our resident poet, when he saw it, called it engineering porn. So there you have it. I think that must have been... Uh, into my engineering porn.